in addition to our concurrent panels, uh, we have a terrific lineup of plenary speakers, including former Defense Secretary Leon Panetta, uh, New York Times bestselling uh, author and reporter Jason DeParle, uh, Lisa Garrett, who is the uh, Director of Personnel for the 115,000 staff strong LA County government, uh, Mariko Silver, former president of Bennington College and uh, Luce Foundation CEO, uh, and more. Uh, plenary speakers to announce. We are going to be excited to announce a couple more in the next week. So I would really encourage you to go to uh, aspinet.org slash annual conference. Um, we have very affordable rates uh, this year, recognizing the constraints that a lot of people are under. Um, and not only for the content of the conference, we also look forward to celebrating the accomplishments of many people who have done so much for our, our community. Uh, I do again want to recognize Roz Alec Batson, who will be recognized this year with the Donald Stone Service to ASPA Award, uh, as well as Craig Grossenbacher, the Chief of the Natural Resources Planning Division uh, for Miami-Dade County's uh, Division of Environmental Resources Management. Uh, Craig will receive the Gaston Award for Excellence in Public Service Management. So. South Florida will be ably uh, and well represented at our conference and that's in no small part making this conference possible is no in no small part due to the generosity of our sponsors and I do want to give a shout out and thanks to uh, FIU for it, this year's support of ASPA's annual conference so it's great to be with you uh, I'm delighted to join you I look forward to uh, being with you for as much of the day as I possibly can uh, and with that I uh, I've done this before. Um, I really enjoy doing it because he's not only a valued um, colleague, he's also a really good friend. I'm delighted to introduce uh, this morning's opening speaker, um, ASPA's president-elect, uh, soon to be uh, ASPA's president, uh, Alan Rosenbaum. Uh, Alan, um, almost all of you know, uh, and I don't need to read his biography. It's in the back of your program and, and many of you know it better than I do. Uh, but I do want to recognize Alan and congratulate him. If you don't know, uh, he has received very recently uh, the distinction from his university um, as uh, FIU's Distinguished University Professor, uh, the highest rank available to full professors at the university, which really is a reflection of his leadership and dedication and contributions and distinction to the field, but also what he's done um, professionally and personally for his colleagues and his students over the years. Uh, a professor in the Department of Public Policy and Administration. Um, Alan uh, is the founding director of FIU's Institute for Public Management and Community Service. Uh, and he has organized um, the annual Inter-American Conference of Mayors and Local Authorities since 1996. Uh, you know that Alan's uh, role extend, extends beyond the United States knowing that our field and our discipline really knows no geographic boundaries. His international presence is very well known, uh, having provided technical assistance um, uh, and research in a, about 100 countries. Uh, he holds um, uh, visiting distinguished professorships uh, around the world, as well as honorary professorships, and really has um, a wealth of background. Both. <laughs> I'm almost done now. I'm almost done. I'm, just, I'm still on time. I'm still on time. Um, but is also very well known both in the practitioner world uh, as well as the as the academic world. And uh, I hope um, he and I haven't talked before he gives his remarks, but I would expect and hope that uh, part of what he'll comment on today are some of his ideas and vision for ASPA uh, during his upcoming presidency, which I know really gets to the heart of what ASPA is about and returning ASPA's role more assertively in the area of adv advocacy on many of the important issues of the day. So Alan, it's great to introduce you and to see you and, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Bill. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you and, and a pleasure to be with our colleagues uh, in South Florida. I mean, this is where I became, uh, well, I had been involved in ASPA a long time ago, but it was 
uh, the South Florida chapter that brought me back to ASPA, and, and that has been a wonderful, wonderful part of my life. And I, I thank all of the leadership of the chapter. I mean, you know, in many ways, this chapter taught me leadership as well. And it uh, is uh, just a pleasure to to work with people like Izzy and Agatha and Roz and all of the many people who have been outstanding leaders of, of this chapter and really made it arguably, uh, it's hard to say what is the best chapter in, in, in Africa, but certainly any, uh, any assessment would put uh, the South Florida chapter in the absolute top rank. And if I may be a little biased, I'd even say it, it really is the top ASPA chapter. In any event, thank you all for inviting me to share some thoughts on uh, the really quite provocative topic of placing humanity in public administration. This is certainly in many respects, a really appropriate year uh, to be uh, talking about this topic, as, as I think Bill and, and Izzy and others have commented. Uh, this has been a year that has required our concern about humanity and humanity uh, as, a, a, as a virtue. It has been also, um, uh, very pleased to see a year in many respects that has called attention to the critical uh, role of the public sector in, in making uh, society function and building a good society. These are topics that some of you have heard me talk about a good bit, but they can't be talked about too much. The, the critical role of our public sector, whether it is uh, inventing all of the uh, new technological innovations, virtually every one of which uh, begins with some sort of either government research project or, or project funded by the government, whether you're talking about computers, whether you're talking about your iPhones, whether you're talking about the internet, or whether you're talking about the vaccines that uh, are making uh, such an have such an important role today. Uh, this is all with, without government, uh, let alone things like roads, schools, et cetera, that we are all so dependent upon. But I wanna talk a tiny bit about the question of humanity and public administration, because it's an interesting topic in a couple of different ways. First of all, if you think about it, uh, the word humanity has, has two basic uh, meanings. One, it has to do with, uh, you know, attitudes toward people, having a sense of humanity, having a sense of uh, commitment. It also is a synonym for all of humankind. And I wanna share just a few brief comments regarding ASPA, well, regarding public administration more generally, and then I will turn to ASPA specifically at the end, as Bill suggested with some of the new directions that I think we're going to be moving in. But PA has always had uh, a concern uh, about humanity. We often forget that because so often uh, we talk about the field having begun with concerns about economy and efficiency. Uh, but there, as I have told many generations of doctoral students over the years, there are really three basic themes that are a part of the intellectual foundation of public administration. One is the relationship between administration and politics. One is the focus on efficiency and 
economy. But the third one is the focus on human relationships and the relationship between all people. And if you look at you know, critical theorists in the field of public administration, uh, you certainly see that. People like Mary Parker Follett, who his book, The Creative Experience, talks about the critical role of relationships between people and the fundamental humanity of people. Elton Mayo, in his famous work at, in the Hawthorne experiments, which basically say that the most important uh, factor in terms of producing effective productivity is concern about people and concern about the humanity of each individual person. The Minnowbrook uh, experience in 1968, which, which gave us in many respects uh, was the foundation for what has become a major pillar of public administration namely issues of equity and social equity. It's easy to forget in many respects uh, that this has been, uh, especially in the past four years, that this has been central to public administration because as I've written it various times, some of you maybe have seen some of my articles in this regard in the Miami Herald, but we have just gone through a period of four years in which we have really seen a new phenomenon of public administration, namely the weaponization of bad public administration uh, for the purposes of achieving particular public policy goals. No need to go through all of this. Uh, there's a long litany from undermining accountability institutions to arbitrary dismissals, to undermining of efficient processes, revolving door administration. So we are in the process, in a sense, of returning to concerns about uh, the real essence of public administration, namely doing good and promoting basic values of society uh, and through uh, our organizational structures and the effectiveness uh, of them. What this does remind me in many respects is the importance of values and values like humanity and concern for humanity uh, for good public administration. This is something too that has been talked about in many respects. Uh, Dwight Waldo wrote a great article, PA and Ethics, a prologue to a preface in which he lays out a dozen value maps, if you will, uh, ethical maps. ASPA, with our work, extensive work on developing and redeveloping and constantly revisiting our code of ethics for administrators. But I, I guess I just cannot emphasize how much values of humanity and commitment to humanity are so central to what public administration is about and has to be about. Because as I have, again, some of you may have heard me say this in the past, you know, good administration uh, can be used for very evil outcomes. It is really a function of the values that we bring uh, to public administration and to our acts as public administrators. And, and values that go beyond just simply law and constitution, uh, granted how important those are, but they must be underlain by a commitment to a certain kind of ethical principles and values. You know, as Hannah Arendt pointed out in her 
uh, great uh, study of the Holocaust, many of the most, almost all of the people involved were not demonic figures, but were rather individuals in many cases thinking they were engaged in good public administration because the law of their country said that what they were doing was the thing to be that they should be doing. So, so this whole issue of the kind of values that we bring is just so central. And it's central also uh, not only in terms of the individual aspects of humanity, people's humanity to one another, but it's also very critical in terms of humanity in the sense of the synonym usage for humankind. Uh, we often think about public administration uh, in terms of these issues of efficiency and separation of politics and administration, uh, but we forget that this is really built on a fundamental framework of belief in democracy and the centrality of democracy uh, for American life. I mean, often, as, as, as many of us will recall, uh, the field thinks about the famous essay by Woodrow Wilson, which talks so much about the separation of politics and administration as you know, kind of shaping our view of the world as a discipline looking uh, at, at these issues. But we forget that in that essay, Wilson writes that the principles on which the basis of a science of administration for America must be built are principles which have democratic policy very much at their heart. In essence, Wilson is arguing that the kind of uh, benefit for at least this country's sense of humankind uh, must be built on democratic values. And this is a topic that concerns me very, very much at the moment. Uh, some of you have probably heard this data. Some of it is new, you haven't heard. But for example, the issue of trust in government. Hopefully the past year will make a difference in this regard. But in 1958, 73% of the American public said they trust in government. In 2019, 17% said. That's a stunning drop. A survey last year by the Pew Foundation found that 25 years ago, uh, looking at their initial effort, at this, 25 years ago, two thirds of the American public uh, trusted in each other to make good judgments about policy and the future of the country. Today, only a third of the American public do. Another Pew study from last year, Pew Foundation study, found that 40% of Democrats do not trust Republicans to have the best interest of the country at heart. And the same is true for Republicans. 40% of them do not have, uh, do not trust in our citizens uh, to have, uh, of, of the opposite party, to have the best interests of the country at heart. A study just completed last month by the American Enterprise Institute found that 40% of Americans now think that citizen violence may be necessary to defend the American way of life. Think about that after January 6th, 40% of the American population essentially are saying that what happened 
uh, or at least that kind of activity, whether they agree particularly with that particular activity or not, uh, they uh, think they're prepared to say that that may be necessary to defend uh, the American way of life. I think these are issues that should concern us and concern us all. Now, arguably what's driving some of this? I don't know if any of you, uh, uh, another source of uh, uh, important data, uh, I don't know if any of you saw the cartoon in this past Sunday's newspaper, Pearls Before Swine, uh, kind of funny cartoon uh, that I read uh, routinely. In this past Sunday's version, it begins with the character, uh, the lead character saying, well, things aren't so bad in this country. Uh, since 1978, the average worker has gained 11% increase in their income. But then another character in the cartoon says, well, what about compensation for chief executive officers? And I haven't checked these figures to know if they're precisely accurate, but they're not far off. Uh, since 1978, that hasn't gained and increased by 11%. It's increased by 940%, at least according to the cartoon. My own, the last data that I saw, and I think a lot depends on how you analyze the data, but uh, it's certainly compared to almost no increase in relative income for uh, the average worker uh, for uh, chief executives of corporations. That's a, at least a 300% increase. And we can see this if we look at the data on inequality uh, in this country, it is growing uh, dramatically. In the, in the 1970s, the top 1% of the American population controlled 20% of the nation's wealth. Uh, today, the top 1% uh, uh, control almost double that. 38% uh, of the nation's wealth. So these I think are critical uh, issues that really do raise questions about the uh, issues of values, humanity, uh, where we as a discipline are going. Let me now in conclusion, briefly turn uh, to the question of ASPA and where I hope it will be going in the next few years. I think a major role, uh, and here I, I congratulate Bill and, and my predecessors, ASPA has done, I think, a great job in uh, providing professional development activities, providing experiences for individuals to improve their level of professional ability and the like. I think we now need to move, especially at this time with the issues that the country is facing, we need to take a more public role in advocating for the kind of country uh, we all want. Uh, in that regard, uh, it is my hope that over the next two years, ASPA can pull together many of the similar organizations in the area of advocating for public interest, whether it is organizations like the City Managers Association or uh, other uh, organizations concerned with the public sector to begin to advocate for important and critical uh, policy initiatives that will address some of these issues of basic values for our society. One of the things I have talked about is ASPA putting together a coalition uh, to work to encourage uh, things like national service, 
we, we forget the important role that national service played uh, during the depression in not only just dealing with issues of poverty, but also bringing Americans together around shared values that we so much need today. The notion of creating a museum of public service and democracy that's more than just bricks and border boards in Washington, bricks and mortar, but that engages in civic education and reaches out to all 50 states. Another idea that I think that has time has come, that's time has come. Issues like uh, really assessing, creating a national commission on democracy that uh, will go well beyond the kind of January 6th commission people are talking about now, but look at fundamental issues concerning equality, inequality, democratic values and the like. So I think there's a big, big role that ASPA and all of its chapters, the South Florida chapter, all of us who are committed members of ASPA, but even more than that, are committed citizens of this great uh, country. I, I think, you know, the, the future is ours to define and we really need to begin uh, doing that. And I think one way that we can do this, all of us who are committed to organizations like ASPA and the public sector, I think if we really come together, part of the problem of I think too many of us has been our fragmentation. I think if we come together, we can really uh, make a difference for ASPA and for this country. And with that, I thank you very much for hearing me out. It's been an honor and a privilege, and I look forward to continuing dialogue with all of you, both through the chapter and nationally. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenbaum. We appreciate your words of wisdom and look forward to supporting you um, as you begin your second term as ASPA national president. Um, at this time, uh, just a few kind of housekeeping. Um, we have shared the program in the chat. Um, there's two ways to view the program, either as a, an issue or if you'd like to download the PDF, please click on the links in the chat. Um, and be sure if you're gonna be joining us this afternoon for the Black History Forum, to be sure to register at go.fiu.edu, Black History 2021. Um, if you're going to be joining us on social media, please be sure to follow us on all of our social media handles, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you're gonna be tweeting or posting about today's event, please use the hashtag 2021 best practices. Um, at this time, we will be taking a break before our next session. Uh, we'll be playing some music and displaying information on the next session. If you have any questions, please use the chat to communicate with us. And again, once if you have questions to the panelists, please use the Q&A function. Um, thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs>